Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher, and today on the program, we have John Fisher, our resident doctor, expert, uh, person of science to do science things. Do you uh, want to introduce hello. yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, I guess I'm John Fisher. I uh, happen to be this guy's brother. What? Um, Don't tell them that. <laughs> that will destroy your credibility. <laughs> My credibility is broken now. All right. So, so today on, on the program, we're going to be talking about Edwin Hatch, and he was a biblical scholar, a scholar of ancient religion who lived during the later part of the 1800s. And so let's, let's take a look at this guy. This guy is an absolute genius. And so just reading his book, it's just amazing just the depth of knowledge that this man has, the the way that he writes, the way that he frames things, his his understanding. This is all before the age of computers and quick references. This guy, it's it blows my mind. So it, it does make me a little bit sad that uh, since he did die before the 1900s, he missed some discoveries which would have really uh, co corroborate. Co <laughs> Uh, uh, collaborated, co corroborated. Uh, what what Cor are we looking for? Cor corroborated, corroborated, corroborated. <laughs> uh, yeah, his his uh, thesis, right? And so you got the Nag Hammurabi library that was that was discovered in the 1940s, and Dead Sea Scrolls. When were they? Do we got date offhand? Uh, other 60s. Yeah, 40s, 50s, and so. Um, so that is sad that we he did miss those developments, which would have proved him true. I'm losing losing all my uh, tabs here. All right, so we'll go ahead and display him, and we'll start reading. <laughs> Corroborated. <laughs> there we go, Roddy. Roddy's helping me out here in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> so here's his introduction. So a lot of. A lot of his phrases I've taken, I've quoted him quite often, especially his imagery about inverted pyramids on chance phrases in church fathers and making too much of a deal over things in which we have very sparse evidence, things of that nature. He's a very quotable individual. So he says, it is impossible for anyone, whether he be a student of history or no, to fail to notice a difference both in form and content between the Sermon on the Mount and the Nicene Creed. And so I, I got the Nicene Creed pulled up, and I was going over my with my kids the other day, uh, the Nicene Creed. <laughs> here's the Sermon on the Mount, and then here's the Nicene Creed. Oh, okay. This this is the explanation of the Nicene Creed. I'll, I'll pull up the actual Nicene Creed. But uh, do you are you familiar with the Nicene Creed? You read it ever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, a very God, right? Right. Light, light from light. It, so it, it's a it's a it's a creed. It's a declaration, right? So yeah, it, that is not meant to be a creed at all, right? And so you take a look at this, and it starts talking about I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, co-substantial with the Father. Through him, all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. So it's just, this is, this is what the concerns are in this. And so what does this mean, light from light? Have you ever read into what these things mean? I, I actually don't know light from light. Right. It, it seems to be synonymous with like God from yeah. God. They're, they're, they're kind of the, the same idea that God is true God God is God's substance well, I I remember that the big debate back in the back in the day was really just the Godhood of Jesus was God was Jesus God was was like was I think the first ecumenical debate in the history of the Christian Church before um, 
and and it led to a lot of fat fracturing but but they ended up coming up with the nicene creed and what was a bit funny i think if i remember properly the result of the nicene creed is that it you know they were arguing with the armenians about this but they phrased everything in the nicene creed in a way that the armenians basically agreed with it anyway yeah it seems that there was some uh smuggling in of uh concepts like like we, we're we're phrasing this in a way that you could kind of affirm it, but really we mean our thing, and so we could start marginalizing you and pushing you out of the church. The other day, there was a guy I was interacting with on Facebook, and he made the insane claim that Origin was a heretic and had departed from the church fathers. I'm like, what church fathers is he depart? He was mainstream in his day. He was celebrated in Christianity during his own lifetime. It's well, not after after he dies that he falls out of favor but yeah exactly he has fallen out of favor right and so that's why he's saying origins a heretic yeah no he's saying that he departed from the church fathers it's like well well who's he uh, from? definitely not clement right. he, he's, right. he's he's talking the same stuff as clement and mm -hmm. clement was drawing on philo of alexandria and philo of alexandria was uh drawing on uh people before him a yeah, he from the people after him <laughs> yeah, he departed for the people. Like early Christianity, this is one of the things that Hatch points out that early Christianity is was very fractured, and it's not until later that a dominant faction takes over, and then they rewrite the history. The only reason we have the Nag Her 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 Hammadi Library, the Gnostic text, was because a priest got buried in his tomb with it because he 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 seemed to have maybe loved it loved all these Gnostic texts, but if we didn't have access to those things because they were just systematically destroyed by the factions that won out. And so we tend to do this thing where we marginalize views by which uh, views that we don't have very much evidence of those views. And he's going to point out, we'll read it, that the evidence that we do have of a lot of these views come only from the opponent. And so Celsus only exists he's a critic of christianity he only exists in the writings of origin who is refuting him so we don't have his works but we have a massive refutation of what he wrote and so you could kind of mentally piece it together but it's not like these guys were very very nice to their enemies right uh, they... and their arguments weren't necessarily 100 percent like dialectical anyway right they, they weren't logically going from one point to the next and and talking about axiomatically this can't be so because of this and this and this right yeah so if you like read against celsius it, it seems to be just like uh here's his book here's kind of what he says in this paragraph chronologically and then uh here's my ref refutation and then we're going to jump to a different point and are those points a page apart? Are they right after each other? Did he skip a bunch of arguments? Uh, we don't know. And so we'll we'll go back. Well, let's take a look at the Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon of the Mount is a little bit different than the Nicene Creed. So it's like, <laughs> blessed are the poor. Yes. <laughs> blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, when people insult you and persecute you, blessed be you. Is like, uh, don't have adultery. Don't murder people. Right, uh, the whole, divorce. It's all about behaviors. Yeah, yeah. it's a moral moral code. But, but I mean, the closest thing you get to a creed in the Bible is is John, right? Just yeah, so of John. It it could be. It depends what what's what's going on there. But he'll talk about this. He says, mm -hmm. "The Sermon on the Mount is a promulgation of a new law of conduct. It assumes beliefs rather than formulates them." I I think that's key as well. Um, it's it's not trying to teach people a new dogmatic system to believe in. It's it's educating them about behaviors in a system that they're already familiar with, okay. and and it's expounding on that. It says, as soon as beliefs rather than formulates them, the theological conceptions which underlie it belong to an ethical rather than a speculative side of theology. We we talked a little bit about that. Metaphysics are wholly absent. And that's one thing I like to focus on. The Bible is almost completely without metaphysics. It doesn't talk about like, what's the substance of God? Uh, what, what's it made out of? What's the particle properties? Uh, are there particle properties? Things like that. The Bible is just not about that. It's very practical in nature. You, know, you got problems here. How do you deal with the problems? 
It, it's about behavior, as we saw from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says, the Nicene Creed is a statement partially of historical facts and partly of dogmatic inferences. The metaphysical terms which it contains would probably have been unintelligible to the first disciples. I asked my boys, I was like, do you think like James and John and uh, Peter would know what very God of very God means and light of light means? <laughs> and they're, they're thinking it's like, the answer is no, they'd have no idea. None of these people know anything what anyone's talking about here. It's yeah. Uh, yeah, they'd be they, really confused. They, they never used that that kind of phrasing, and they wouldn't even really know what that meant, probably. Yeah, there's a scene in the Bible where Jesus says, uh, "Who do you guys think I am?" And they're all just like guessing random things. It's 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 very it's, God it's, of very God. Is they're what? like, "Well, <laughs> you are the the hypostasis <laughs> of." <laughs> I, th I think there's a meme like that where uh, someone gives like a Trinitarian answer to Jesus and he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like it says, uh, uh, he says the metaphysical terms, which it contains the Nicene Creed would probably have been unintelligible to the first disciples. Ethics have no place in it. The one belongs to the world of Syrian peasants, the other to a world of Greek philosophers. And th this is what he's attempting to prove with this work. Mm -hmm. This work is very systematic, so it, it's very culturally orientated, not just theology, but uh, education, uh, how, how people are promoted in the pedagogy, uh, how people, uh, what they do for entertainment, the, the lectures that they go to, the banquets that they hold, things like that. Everything about how this Greek world in total has influenced Christianity and been incorporated into it. He says, the contrast is patent. It, the contrast is obvious. If anyone thinks that it is sufficiently explained by saying that one is a sermon, so here, here's your, your thing you said. If anyone thinks that it is sufficiently explained by saying that one is a sermon and the other is a creed, it must be pointed out in reply that the question why an ethical sermon stood at the forefront of the teaching of Jesus Christ and a metaphysical creed in the forefront of Christianity of the fourth century is a problem which claims investigation. So does that make sense? Does that answer your objection? Well, yeah, I just wasn't sure why he was picking the, the creed instead of, you know, the first chapter of John. But, but yeah, it actually, the, the Sermon on the Mount is the most defining thing that, uh, defining thing that Jesus said. Not necessarily the most defining thing he did, but definitely the, the most defining thing he said. So James McKenna says, apparently Paul brought Platonism into Christianity at Mars Hill. Mars Hill is interesting because he's dealing with the Stoics and the Epicureans. Now, the Epicureans believe uh, that the, they're kind of deistic. Uh, sometimes they're they're depicted as polytheistic. There's there's a statement in Cicero on the nature of the gods that the Epicureans just worship any random random statue and uh, even anonymous statues. So the anonym, anonymous statue that Paul points out in in Mars Hill, that incident, um, he, he's, he's saying, you guys are already worshiping this, you Epicureans, you just worship any random statue. This unknown god uh, that you made to, uh, like, they thought they like missed some deities, and so they just make yeah. statues to those yeah. deities. It was it was a safety valve, right? Just in case they they had they they wanted to worship as many possible things as possible. Yeah, the Epicureans but, but they were all about. That they weren't they weren't necessarily everything. They didn't necessarily know if they found everyone. Epicureans were not really about worshiping nothing, but more about sort of pantheism, right? They're they're like let's do practically what yeah, we practice. can yeah. to have the best life now. And if there's going to be a deity out there mad at me, mm -hmm. I'm going to risk praying to that deity so that I could get that potential benefit and avert potential harms. And the Stoics, on the other hand, believed in almost like a pantheism. There there there's a primal element in the world that uh, is is one right? God is everywhere. God is everything. And you, and you see Paul incorporating some of the claims of both of those in their response to this to these two disparate groups of people on Mars Hill. And so it's it's interesting to see his interaction. And what, what's their reaction? Their reaction is they don't believe him. 
Uh, he, yeah. he goes away. He gets a couple converts, but it's not from the Stoics and Epicureans. It doesn't look like. Yeah, You're wait, just like, wait. this guy's... Yeah, Athens was the least successful of his missionary journeys. And, yeah, and as... he, he was basically tossed out of town. It was right when he... Any letters to them. It, it's at the very moment he says, uh, resurrection of the dead. And they're like, okay, we're out. Not, not, none of this. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. So it says, it claims investigation back to Edwin Hatch, but it's not yet been investigated. There's been inquiries. I'm going to skip forward. It asks, how, not how did the Christian societies come to believe one proposition rather than another, but how did they come to, to the frame of mind which attached importance to either one or the other? This is the contrast between the ethical focus of Christianity morphing into the dogmatic focus of Christianity. You see that change from the first century to the fourth century. He says, uh, which had attained either to the one or the other and made the assent to one rather than the other, a condition of membership. This, this, this is the whole Arian heresy that you're talking about, that people are getting kicked out of the church because they're disagreeing whether uh, it's a, uh, whether Jesus is like substance or the substance of God, right? right? Just one difference, one letter difference in the Greek. In investigating this problem, the first point is that obvious to the inquirer, that is the change in the center of gravity from the conduct to belief is coincident. That means it arises at the same time with the transference of Christianity from a Semitic to a Greek soil and so can, can, are you able to name off any early church fathers who are direct disciples of the 12 disciples well no no i mean you could arguably say christianity is really polyanity because christianity in its present form and its success is only there at least it maybe maybe you have like synoptic fathers or something like that, but everything else is is the direct effect of Paul's missionary journeys. And it, it's really hard to find Paul's direct disciple lineage as well. You can find it in Gnostics. There are some Gnostics who claim direct discipleship from Paul, which makes sense. Paul um, didn't take on disciples. Well, that's like I'm a Paul. I'm of Apollos. You know those types of things. Uh-huh. And so people who knew Paul and interact with interacted with him and claim to be have taught directly from him. You're not going to find too many church fathers who had direct access, whose writings we currently have, who had direct access to the actual 12 disciples. You're going to find maybe Clement of Rome, uh, maybe Ignatius, Polycarp, maybe, uh, but none of, none of the Alexandrian fathers, not Clement, not Origen, not uh, Justin Martyr in Rome. These people are not direct lineages. And so when Christianity shifts to them as the focus, this is what Edwin Hatch is saying, that it, it turns out it just so happens that as Christianity shifts from Israel, uh, the temple's destroyed in 70 AD, a center of Judaism is destroyed, center of Christianity is wiped out, the focus shifts to the Greek world. And th about that time, coincidentally, all these Greek values come streaming into, into the church. All right. The difficulty, the interest, and the importance of the subject make it incumbent upon us to approach it with caution. It's necessary to bear many points in mind as we enter upon it. I'll begin by asking your attention to two considerations, which being true and uh, of all analogous phenomena, of the religious development and change may be presumed to be true of this particular phenomena before. So he's going to set out two rules for understanding how cultures change. The first is that the religion of a given race at a given time is relative to the whole mental attitude of that time. It is impossible to separate the religious phenomena from the other phenomena in the same way that you could separate a vein of silver from the rock in which it's embedded. There are as much determined by they are as much determined by the general characteristics of the race as the fauna and the flora of a geographical area are determined by its soil, its climate, and its cultivation. And they vary with the changing characteristics of the race as the fauna, as the flora of the territory uh, te tertiary system differ from those of the chalk. They are separable from the whole mass of phenomena, not in fact, but only in thought. We may concentrate 
our attention chiefly upon them, but they still remain part of the whole complex life of the time, and they cannot be understood except in relation to that life. If anyone hesitates to accept this historical induction, uh, does that make sense? Do you accept it, or are you one of these skeptics? Religion cannot be separated from the culture in which it grows up in. Yeah, it can't be separated. Yeah, absolutely not. If anyone hesitates to accept I mean this, it's it's not simply the Greeks that that this is demonstrated in. As Christianity spread to all the different societies, you could see the that they basically incorporated the traditions and heritage of that society and just rephrased it in terms of Christianity. It's the reason we have Christmas trees. Yeah, so it's uh, we adopt our cultural surroundings. He says, if anyone doubts this, I will ask him to take the instance that lies nearest to him. So that's modern Christianity for us. And consider how he could understand the religious phenomena of our own country in our own time, its doubts, its hopes, its varied enterprises, its shifting enthusiasm, its noise, its learning, its asceticism, and its philanthropies, unless he took account of the growth of the inductive sciences and mechanical arts, the expansion of literature, of the social stress, of the commercial activity, of the general drift of society towards its own improvement. So all we have to do is look at modern Christianity. You have a drag queen story hour in DC churches being being given to kids in churches. Like, like that wouldn't happen 50 years ago. This is a cultural value Right. That now now churches are talking about both for and against because the culture has shifted. Now it's a focus. It's like, why didn't Jesus preach against homosexuality? It's not a big deal at the time. That's not like a thing that they're engaging in. It's not right. important for him to address, right? And so at our, our culture shifts. Christianity changes. Our values change. Another one I gave to my kids is this uh, anti-alcohol a crusade by primarily American, primarily fundamentalist, primarily Baptists in America. It's like, where did this come from? It's it's not in any other part of the world where there's this crusade against alcohol. It, it's a hangover from our prohibition. Our, yeah, from prohibition. Th these values are are particularly American, particularly got integrated in the church, and. Uh, has been now accepted as fact yeah. and you go elsewhere there everyone's confused you've got evangelical churches and wesleyan churches and baptist churches all their communions are with grape juice <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> yeah like my tour guide in greece when i did that biblical tour he's like as soon as you 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 harvest the grapes it starts fermenting they didn't they didn't have chemicals to preserve it as grape juice Grape juice is not a thing in the ancient world. Uh, uh, Jesus is making wine for people at these weddings. Uh, th th this, this is what they just normally drink. Of you course, remember we mentioned that, and the guy's like, oh, but it's the type of wine. It's non-alcoholic. Uh, yeah, that, like, the, the guy we dealt with a lot. Whatever. Oh, it's it's funny, like, like Paul's saying, you guys are getting drunk at your, at <laughs> <laughs> your communions. And he's like, stop getting drunk at your communions. <laughs> It doesn't say alcohol is so evil. We shouldn't have alcohol at our communions because alcohol is evil. He's like, you guys are getting wasted. Make sure that you're sharing. This is this is not a time for getting wasted, guys. Mm -hmm. Not a time. And so we, we do see quite evidently in our own religious culture these, these, these cultural hangovers that are not derived from the Bible itself, but moral, ethical, philosophical concerns – are, are integrated. It's like Jesus, you don't hear him giving an argument for God based on the Calum cosmological principle or anything like that. You're, you're not going to find that in the Bible. It's just, it's not part of their worldview that they have access to. It's not something that they've considered or talked about or think about. It's just not part. It, it only becomes part of a, a, the Christian story when it starts interacting with people who have those values. And so in the Talmud, that's where you find some first instances of people talking about God's future foreknowledge of all events is when they're debating against Greeks about the attributes of God, and then they have to defend certain propositions in certain ways. And, and that's where, where you see that 
that change happening, once they start interacting with other cultures, they start incorporating those cultural values, those argumentations, the, the language, the language, uh, it, it, no one, no one's ever heard of cisgender before three years ago, right? Th this new language is cropping up and people are incorporating it into their vocabulary. And uh, a lot of Christians are adopting the language of their ideological opponents just to use back against them. Maybe not the best strategy, but you do see that that change in language, the thought process and argumentation based on these cultural influences. And so I think that's pretty self-evident. I think I think Hatch knows what he's talking about there. Yeah, I, I think most people understand that Christianity just sort of takes its own form depending on the culture. We even see uh, when we went to India that they have a tradition of Thomas being stabbed. And, and they, they the, the Portuguese, when they went there, they, they decided to build a whole chapel to Thomas saying that he was stabbed by the locals in this area and that he was really, that, that India itself has a sort of heritage of this. And, but I think they had a lot of iconography that was very much sort of Indian converted iconography for, for making a, like a, a chapel and a tomb for Thomas. It, it's happening all the time. Yeah. Hatch says in dealing therefore with the problem before us, we must endeavor to realize to ourselves the whole mental attitude of the Greek world in the first, first three centuries of our era. We must take into account the breadth and depth of its education, of its many currents of philosophy, love of literature, its skepticism, and its mysticism. We must gather together what evidence we can find, not determining the existence or measuring the extent of the drifts of thought by their literary expression, but taking note also of the testimony of the monuments of art and history, paintings and sculptures, and the descriptions and laws. So he, he, he weaves together this vast amount of data from all sorts of diverse diverse sources and so it, it's actually pretty good he's like he quotes statues and and uh, archaeology that the, is found all right so i'm going to just kind of scroll down to the second consideration the second consideration is that no permanent change takes place in the religious beliefs or usages of a race, which is not rooted in the existing beliefs and usages of that race. Does that make sense? That's it, it, it's a, that's, that seems like a strong claim actually. Right. So he's saying that uh, what changes is, you have Christianity, for example, and then you get exposed to these other ideas, and then Christianity stays, but you add more thoughts on top of them. Yeah, you you rephrase it in a certain way, but he's saying it like it it has to be rooted in the existing beliefs, and therefore, like any sort of change. I don't know if if it's if you can actually argue that there aren't certain people who just have fun fundamentally different values in a way that they, they they're not responding to something i know most of the time you're responding to something in context and it just seems like it's too absolute to me well he's just saying that you're not going to throw out every single bit of tradition you're going to modify it uh -huh. and uh it, it's a continual modification of what's previously been taken for granted or assumed or embedded in your culture, which makes sense that it's, it's going to have to be based off of something. It's not like you're just going to throw out an entire worldview and then adopt another one blank slate. He talks about some of his examples. There are Jewish minds which had been ripening for the Greek philosophy. And so far as they were ripe for them, they received them. In a similar way, we shall find that Greek Christianity of the fourth century was rooted in Hellenism. The Greek minds, which had been ripening for Christianity, had absorbed new ideas and new motives. But there was a continuity between their present and past. The new ideas and the new motives mingled with the waters of existing currents. And it is only by examining the sources and the volume of the previous flow 
that we shall understand how it is that the Nicene Creed, rather than the Sermon on the Mount, has formed the dominant element of Arian Christianity. So not only... Oh, yeah, go ahead. I I think just as an illustration of what he's saying, the the story Augustine himself has of his own conversion is describing just this. He was a he was a Greek thinker. He had adopted Manichaeism and then he moved on to Platonism. And then he says the only reason that he was ever able to convert to Christianity is that his this pastor Ambrose showed him how Platonism is completely compatible with Christianity. He was he and it, it seems that's a good example of just sort of the general mentality of the people of that time. Is that if you if you can't rephrase it in terms of that rooted belief system in the first place, they wouldn't have adopted it. Yeah, there's a quote by Nietzsche that uh, Platonism is, our Christianity is Platonism for the people. And uh, there, there's a quote like that, I think, in Pulfrey as well. So during the time of Augustine, there was a Neoplatonist, Pulfrey, who basically wrote that, that Christianity was Platonism for the people. So what the claim is, is that you know, Platonism was the religion of the elites. Platonism and Stoicism, as uh, Hatch points out, were like the dominant forces, mostly Platonism, though. And so um, it, it's popular with the elite classes. And so those types of things that are popular with the elite classes kind of filter down. Christianity gave a popular, a populist version of that Platonistic movement that they could latch on to. And so that accounts for a lot of its spread and acceptance, especially among the elite classes. So he says, the method of investigation, like that of all investigations, must be determined, be determined by the nature of the evidence. The special feature of evidence which affects the method is that it is ample in regard to the causes and ample also in regard to the effects, but scanty in regard to the process of change. And so this is a very important note. So we got a lot of evidence of what Christianity looked like under Jesus, under the disciples. There's plenty of evidence going on there. We got plenty of evidence of what it looks like in the fourth century. We got tons and tons of writings. We got uh, Augustine. We got Origin of Alexandria. We got Clement. We got just a ridiculous amount of writing. So it's he's saying we got a lot of evidence about what different phases looked like. The evidence that we're missing, though, is the development process, how one shifts to the other. It's it's not that's the part that we have to piece together from the evidence to try to figure out how this infiltration worked and and what was the process by which these ideas changed over time. That's what that's what we're coming up with doing our detective work to figure out that that's not as obvious. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's not that hard to, to hypothesize, though, I think, because just the, just the notion that you can't teach everyone everything at all times, so they're just going to use their default beliefs and answers to certain things means that that change is, is mostly going to be um, just the, the slight changes from the, they, they hold on to all of their Hellenistic thinking, but then Christianity itself becomes popular, so they have to adapt to it. In some ways, uh, you you could say that Platonism basically had to adapt to Christianity, rather than people were adapting Christianity by adding Platonism. Yeah, there there's a book um, that's that call it's called what is it called? It's that uh, anti open theist book about God in motion, and that's what he argues. He's like, it's not that. Christianity was Hellenized. Is that uh, Helen, Hellenized people were Christianized? I'm like, oh yes, that that is a big thank you, thank you for that brilliant insight. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sure that means something. I'm sure that has some sort of, I don't know. It, you proved me wrong. Okay, it, sure. It wasn't Christianity that was Hellenized. It's the Hellens that were Christianized. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so it, it, there, there is there is this blending, and this is what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. He says, uh, here, here's a question. In your mind, what does Greek philosophy and Calvinism get wrong about the Trinity? Well, the whole Trinity conception, the hypostatic union, is not a first century concern. 
And so this debate about the nature and substance of God, is God simple substance, is God compound substance? These are not concerns of the earth. They, they don't care about this. It's not within, it's not even on their radar to talk about or think about. And so that becomes a very big thing on the radar yeah. after the third century. Because Jesus's metaphysical relationship to God is it, it is a big thing to challenge things like divine simplicity. If somehow there are multiple gods, then there is no divine simplicity. For example, and right, and yeah. and and the entire Arian and uh, classical debate, they're both Platonists. They both accept Platonistic metaphysics. The Arians were just a little bit more consistent Platonists by saying that. You can't have a trinity and a simple substance. And the yeah. Trinitarians are saying, yes, you can have a trinity and a simple substance, uh, which that doesn't make sense. These are these are Platonistic value sets. It's a Platonistic worldview. And first century Jews will have no idea what anyone's talking about. These are not things in their mind. This is not this is not a debate that they're having. And so <laughs> The, the character and nature of God's substance is not a biblical concern. Who God is, his personality, how he acts and behaves, what he can do for us in the here and now, what he will do for us in the future, those are all biblical concerns. They're all practical. And we, we talked already earlier about how you move from ethical imperatives to dogmatic imperatives. It's, it's a different frame of mind. Uh, no one's talking about the substance of God at the time of Jesus. Yeah, so it is interesting because of that, Christianity essentially spread from the ground up, and so it, it's it's the poor, it's the meek, it's the the unthreatening, it's the unphilosophical people who are picking it up, and essentially the intellectuals of the age they were the the last to switch over. They, they essentially had to switch over when uh, Constantine flipped the entire um, Roman world to Christianity because the way state religions themselves work is that, you know, there, there was no such thing as sort of like uh, separation of church and state. The state enforced what the religion because it, the state is supposed to enforce what is true and that in turn is what validates the authority of the state in the first place. And yeah, it's, so, it's it's really funny. Like Constantine, then he had to take sides. I don't think he cared about Arians yeah, versus yeah. Trinitarians. He immediately had to deal with this dispute from the major church fathers. He probably came into these meetings like, this is all stupid. Okay, whatever <laughs> the main thing is, that's what we'll do. And yeah. then what happens is the Arian Christians are persecuted. Right, and this persecution. So you have the Germans, uh, that uh, they're they're Aryan Christians, and they're being persecuted by the Romans. And guess what? They turn into the Vandals, and the Vandals sweep through northern Africa, through Carthage, and then up and finally sack Rome. It comes ahead. Augustine dies with the Vandals on his doorstep. I, I, I like to pretend that the Vandals killed him in retaliation for all the persecution of the Aryans, but that he, uh, that that's not in the historical record anywhere, but it's, it's a nice thing to pretend, but uh, yeah, these guys are persecuted and then they got their little revenge. I was trying to name one of my kids, make his middle name guys, Eric after uh, the vandal leader who uh, sacked Rome. Got to convince your wife of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like <laughs> guys, Eric. And she's like, I don't know about that. And like, it's a good name, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So Hatch says this, we have ample evidence in regard to the state of Greek thought during the anti-Nicene period. The writers shine with a dim and pallid light when put side by side with the master spirits of the Attic age, but their lesser importance in the scale of genius rather adds than to diminishes from their importance as re representatives. They are more children of their time. They are consequently better evidence as to the currents of its thought than men who supremely transcend it. I'll mention those from whom we shall derive most of our information. So he talks about people like Dio, Christosom and Dio, Dio the, uh, him of the golden mouth. Uh, that that's interesting. We get a lot of our information about like the mystery cults from Dio. He was a satirist, and so he wrote critiques of Roman literature, things like that. I'll scroll through. Plutarch's actually 
a very important one. Plutarch is a Platonist. We get a lot of our information about the lives of people from Plutarch and the state of theology from Plutarch. He, he, he's a good practicing Platonist, so he's good. Marcus Aurelius, he wrote Meditations. Everyone should be familiar with that. Philo of Alexandria is very important. Philo of Alexandria only exists because he was picked up by the Christian world. Origin of Alexandria took Philo's work and uh, hid it in his, hid it, brought it to, uh, preserved it in his library at Caesarea. The Jewish world didn't care about Philo. He wasn't a major thought thinker. He wasn't majorly influential in that world. Yeah, people like Eusebius basically saying, oh, Philo might have been like a pre-Christian or a quasi-Christian. He, he's basically one of us. They also say that about Plato <laughs> when, you're, when you're reading these things. It's like, Plato is basically one of these uh, us Christians. Like, uh, if he knew about Jesus, he'd definitely be a Christian. Trust <laughs> us on it. <laughs> like, I don't think so. I don't think so. It talks about the Greek fathers. We'll skip through that. Ah, <sighs> okay. So this is this is interesting. So if we look at the literature of the schools of thought, which ultimately became dominant, we find that it consists, for the most part, of some accidental survivals. And so I think he lists off four major Christian thinkers. Oh, oh, here, right here in the footnote here. He says Tertullian singles out four writers of previous generations whom he regards as standing on equal footing. So these are equal footing Christian philosophers. Justin, Justin Martyr, Miltades, Irenaeus, and Proculus. Of these, Proculus has entirely perished. Of Miltades, only a few fragments remain. Justin survives only in a single manuscript. And the greater part of Irenaeus remains only in a Latin translation. So Ir Irenaeus also, uh, yeah, well, it, Irenaeus is own, his own thing. He's very, very much Hellenized, Ir Ir Irenaeus by that time. But he's saying these people are on equal footing. We, d we don't have half of it. Half of it's completely missing. And the, the stuff that we do have is we just accidentally have it. it. We didn't have to have it. It's a miracle that this stuff came down to us and is still available to us. And so these accidental discoveries like the Dead Sea Scrolls, these these are major findings and they, they upset the entire archaeological world because we, we just don't have access to all these documents. These books are disappearing. Oh, it's if you start reading through the Roman histories, so much of our, their history books are missing or fragmentary. Uh, Homer, we got two two works from Homer. Uh, Homer had a lot more books than that. He went over the whole Trojan War. When when we pick up at Iliad, it's at the last part of the Trojan War. We're missing so much of his work. Ah, so he says in regard to Palestine, in which uh, in the third and the fourth centuries was a great center of culture, we have only the evidence of Justin Martyr. In regard to Adrian Minor, it seems to we have the chief crucible for the alchemy of transmutation. We have such scanty fragments of Mileto and Gregory. I'm going to scroll down. We we just we don't have very much evidence from what exists. If we look at the literature of the schools of thought, which were ultimately branded as heretical. Now, this is a very important point. If we look at those schools, which were ultimately branded as heretical, we look almost wholly in vain. So he's saying the people that, the pe that are eventually called heretics, they're not called heretics right away. Remember, Valentinius, if you read Eusebius's history, he almost became Bishop of Rome. Valentinius. Like the founder of the Valentinius Gnostic heresy, almost was the leading figure in Christianity. That was his power. That was his pull. That's who these guys are debating. That's why you find works by a people like Tertullian against Marcion, like massive major works going in great detail against these people. It's because these people have followings. These people are major elements, major currents. But all their works are disappeared. Their works have been destroyed. The Christians, the Orthodox Christians, who are eventually called Orthodox, once they came to power, it was a slash and burn. Everything that they didn't like, they destroyed. Gnostic texts, 
we, we just we just don't have those texts anymore. He says, what the earliest Christian philosophers thought, and he's talking about those labeled heretical, what the earliest Christian philosophers thought, we know with comparatively insignificant expressions only from the writings of their opponents. So on, on uh, YouTube the other day, someone comments on one of my videos and they're like, oh, you just sit in your ivory tower and uh, talk bad about all these church fathers which are persecuted. Ugh. I'm like, well, how do you say the same thing about like <laughs> the 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 Marcionites and the Val <laughs> the Arians, the Arian, the, their persecution? He's like, no, those guys are heretics. Like, <laughs> so you sit in your ivory tower criticizing those people who went through real persecution and yeah. death for their beliefs? Pro yeah, probably how even harsher because they lost. Yeah, they lost. They're being persecuted <laughs> out of existence. They're getting killed not only by Rome, but then they have to deal with people like Augustine. Augustine uh, was fighting against the, the Donatists. Uh, what is it? Donatists. The don and the Donatists weren't great people. It, it's not like they were nice to Augustine and then he was mean to them. They're, they're both very vicious sects that were fighting against each other and a lot of blood spilt over these... Because the Donatists were the ones who saved the Bible when Christianity was being persecuted. Uh, that they, like The Romans would go around burning Bibles and the Donatists saved it at the pain of death. So their people would rather die than give up the Bible. And so when... Christianity comes to power, the Donatists see all these people who have betrayed the Bible walking back into power. It's it's, it's like the Civil War and the North wins and uh, the next Congress section, session, then like all, all the, the Southern, the, Southerners. The, the, the same senators from before the war are coming yeah. back and they're like, okay, we need to uh, scrap all laws that we have right now and quick pass an amendment that says these people can't come back. <laughs> yeah. You guys don't get a vote on it, by the way. We'll just do it. <laughs> so that's what it was like. And so uh, none of them are very good people, but they did experience persecution from dominant or the power structures that be. This is, oh, look at this. They were the subject to a double hate that of the heathen schools which they had left and that of the christians who are saying non possumus to philosophy yeah, but but the point is actually that all of these people were subject to given hate the people who won were also subject to that hate from other christians because that's where the feuds were happening yeah so i i'm gonna pull up pull up marcion against marcion by tertullian and uh, we'll see how objective he is in talking <laughs> about who Marcion is. So he says, hey, Marcion was born in this place. And it's kind of like cold and stuff like that. And you know, a bunch of prostitutes and things like that. Uh, but Marcion was born there. If fouler than any Scythian, more <laughs> roving than a wagon life of the Samaritan, more inhuman than the Majesty, more audacious than an Amazon, darker than a cloud of... Pontus, colder than its winter, more brittle than its <laughs> ice, more deceitful than the Ister, more craggy than the Castus. Nay, more, the true Prometheus, almighty God, is mangled by me. I say Marcion's <laughs> blasphemies. Marcion is more savage than even the beasts of that barbarous reason. For what beaver has there ever been a greater emasculator than he who has abolished the nuptial bond? What Pontic mouse ever has such gnawing powers as he who has gnawed the Gospels to pieces. <laughs> Barely, <laughs> oh, ex-queen, you have produced a monster more credible to the philosophers than to the Christians. Oh, it's, it's, it's like Marcion has quenched the light of his faith and so lost God, who be found his disciples will not deny that his first face he held along with themselves. Oh, it's just, I, I, I don't think Tertullian is going to be I don't know, neutral, a neutral party. And, a, a, a objective, dispassionate. <laughs> I, he's not going to, he's not going to, let's like step back and say, okay, let's, let's, let's uh, scholarly look at uh, Marcion's claims and evaluate them. And so Marcion's thing for anyone who doesn't know is Marcion, like a lot of modern Christians is like, well, the God of the old Testament's a nice God and the God of the old Testament's a mean God. So this might resonate with like modern Christians. And so 
th this was his jump of conclusion. They must be different gods. There, there, there's a visible God in the Old Testament. This is Yahweh. He's a creator God. And he created the world and the world's all gross and corrupt. But then the true God reveals himself in the New Testament and sends Jesus. And this, this is a way for salvation for all men. And so that's his, his idea. He's, and so his big book was uh, Contradictions. And so he take like an Old Testament passage and then take a New Testament passage and say, look what it's saying here. And that's kind of the opposite of what it's saying here. Therefore, they're different gods. And so we don't we don't have that book. We don't have that book. Sadly. But uh, yeah, I don't I don't think they're there. He's going to be objective. The little trust that yeah. we can place. Oh, so, yeah. So so you you had a thought that like people like Marcy were also somewhat they had big followings uh it, it's probably worthwhile to note that all these debates they're taking place all over the mediterranean uh i know for example the the in the big aryan controversy like the the dominant beliefs were very regional depending on where you were that they're different churches of different cities that that follow different things and so who wins out is not really just who convinces the most people for the most area it's just which city became dominant most powerful and then we're able to dictate terms for the rest of the world for this religion yeah like imagine a world in which the vandals actually held power rather than only for like 200 years holding power if they had retained that power we'd all be aryan christians today uh, we'd all be like, oh, those those yeah. hypostatic union Trinitarians, uh, they just deny it's divine like they all, simplicity. They all believe weird things, didn't they, they back they then? They all believe God has parts. Those Good thing the Vandals parts. restored Christianity. Yeah. Good thing Geyseric overthrew Rome, made them pay tribute, and drove out those heretics who believe in a three-headed God, like Serv Servetus is like the <laughs> servitus is like uh the doctrine of the hypostatic union doesn't line up with the idea of of divine simplicity uh you're adding parts to the godhead god has to be simple so yeah it's like well that that is your philosophy that that is what platonist a good platonist would believe <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst kill him <laughs> yeah, yeah like uh john calvin's like what you believe that Jesus is God's son, and Jesus is divine, and Jesus is God, but you deny the hypostatic union? Death penalty! <laughs> <laughs> Kill that man before what he thinks spreads to other people. I did a whole episode which I read Servetus's actual writings, and it's indistinguishable from Calvin's ideas of Trinity. It's like where, where's the new one? He got killed over like absurd nuances that nobody cares about. That's what he died for. It says the result is naturally that the counts, which, which the several opponents give are so different in form and future as to be irreconcilable with one another. It is also so with the heathen opponents of Christianity. With an, one important exception, we cannot tell how the new religion struck a d dispassionate outsider observer or why it was that it left so many philosophers outside its fold. It's saying we don't have neutral accounts. We either have advocates or we have critics of these theologies. We don't have neutral accounts. We don't know how like the average man felt when they encountered this teaching. Like, I mean, it's okay. hard to imagine that there would be someone who's just acting as a scholar of different theologies at the time. Well, the closest you're going to get is someone probably like Cicero, who's writing on the nature of the gods. But even in his work, he shows favoritism to the various beliefs, various yeah. ideas. But that that's the closest you're going to get. Someone who's trying to do like a worldview comparison. When the associated Christian communities won at length their hard-fought battle, they burned the enemy's camp. So this is what I'm talking about with Edwin Hatch's imagery, his writing style. He, he, he says basically up here, he says that 
Uh, <laughs> if we look for the literature of the schools of thought, which were ultimately branded as heretical, we look almost wholly in vain. It's like we're searching for these things. We can't find them. They weren't originally heretical. Then they became heretical. And and now they're, all their works are missing. And he's talking about uh, warfare type imagery here, that the Christian communities who won just had a burned a scorched earth campaign against their enemies, burned all their literature, destroyed it all. The reason we have Celsus, for example, the reason we have Pulfrey, for example, is because people wrote against them. And so you have to piece together their works from their critics, their critics quoting them. Maybe not the best place to get it, but it's the only place we got. So he's giving us uh, two more, two more questions. He says, this fact is this, the, this fact of the scantiness and inadequacy of the evidence as to the process of transformation has led to two results which constitute difficulties and dangers in, in our path. The one is the tendency to overrate the value of the evidence that has survived. When only two or three monuments of a great movement remain, it is difficult to appreciate the degree in which those monuments are representative. We tend at at almost all times to attach an exaggerated importance to individual writers, the writers who have molded the thoughts of their contemporaries instead of being molded by them are always few in number and exceptional. He's saying that not everyone whose works we have a ton of writings for are the influencers of society. A lot of times they were influenced themselves by society and are regurgitating a lot of common notions at their time. People I would put in this realm is someone like Origin of Alexandria, who is a disciple of Ammonia Sactus. He's drawing on Clement of Alexandria. He's regurgitating stuff. It's it's not necessary. He's not necessarily innovating things. He's he might be a popularizer of other people. Augustine too. Uh, it's not that he's coming up with all these ideas himself. He's probably more likely a popularizer and uh, a scribe of common tendencies that are happening during his time frame. If that makes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, they, they became the most popularizer of the theory, though. It'd be like uh, saying, like, like there's a nuclear war and uh, all of American literature is destroyed. And there's an archaeologist who comes across a Stephen Jay Gold book. He's like, oh, this guy must have been like he popularized evolution or he, he came up with all yeah. these good theories. It's like, uh, I don't know about that. Maybe not. Maybe not says, we also tend to attach an undue importance to phrases which occur in such writers. Few, if any, writers write with the precision of a legal document. Now, this is very important. This is what I quote. I think I quote it in my, my first book, and it's probably in the one I'm writing currently. It's, it's a very important phrase. It says, few, if any, writers write with the precision of a legal document and the inverted pyramids. This is the imagery again. An inverted pyramid is an upside down pyramid. It doesn't have a base. It's unstable. It's going to fall over. And it's the perfect imagery for what's happening. Like, let's say there's a Calvinist and they're reading the Bible. They have this one little phrase. And then then what's what's above that? Like paragraphs and paragraphs of text. Mm -hmm. Like it's an inverted pyramid. Their evidence is scanty. And their conclusion is very, very unstable. Yeah, because right. their goal is not to use evidence to get to their conclusion. Their goal is to t tell you everything in their mind. <laughs> yes. To talk a lot. And so they use the evidence simply as a launching pad to say whatever they feel like. Right. But even, even careful ar archaeologists and scholars have a tendency to overestimate phrases. Like they'll come across a word... And they'll say, oh, this word must have meant this. Like, let's say they come across yeah. logos in Clement or Justin, and then they they write entire papers about it. We just yeah. don't have that much evidence to support any particular de facto view about their usages of certain phrases. Because as he points out, few, if any writers write with the precision of a legal document, they're writing letters. They're not writing manuals of of putting together complicated machinery. They're, they're just normal speakers. And so normal speakers will vary their language. They'll use different words to express the same concept. They won't remember which words they used previously and use different words. 
then people will come to these works and be like, oh, he used this word over here and he used this word over here. He is going for this nuanced definition between the two. It's like, that's, that's not how people talk. That's not how people write. Uh, that's definitely not how you should read the Bible where it's like, oh, the gospel is used here. Gospel is used there. So I got this very specific definition. And every time this word is used, it has to be this very specific thing. And, and uh, then you just like grab every single context and you just start adding them together to come up with this like super definition of what gospel means based on all the times it's used in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a word. It's, it's, it's a common phrase. It's a chance phrase. Uh, so we shouldn't, we should uh, guard ourselves against assigning undue importance to chance phrases, words that are used in normal conversation. He says, the inverted pyramids, which we have, which have been built upon chance phrases of Clement or Justin, are monuments of caution, which we shall do well to keep before our eyes. <clears throat> so, his second thing is two. The other is a tendency to underestimate the importance of the opinions would that have disappeared from sight, or which we know only from the form and to the extent of their quotation by their opponents. I'm sure that makes sense. Yeah, we've been going over that. <clears throat> right. He says, <clears throat> do, 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 S, uh, or, did I lose it? If we were to trust the histories that are commonly current, we should believe that there was from the very first a body of doctrine of which the certain writers were the recognized exponents. So he's saying that if, if we only use the evidence we have now, we say, oh yeah, Orthodox Christianity has a fairly clear lineage and all these other groups were ro rogue splinter groups they're just they're not mainstream christianity well this is before like yeah. not karami that, library that, that is essentially what the narrative is right it now. is the narrative like if you if you told if ask catholics about what uh what is the true doctrine they'll say they've always had and been teaching the true doctrine and they're just spending all their time expelling heretics yeah, it's like uh, uh, the church was never corrupted. The church has this clear lineage. We we're always in the dominance, and there are these small, well, insignificant. Yeah, yeah, they they say the purpose of councils was always just to clarify what everyone already believed, and so it was <laughs> it was like there were heretics, or they were just people who realized that there was some ambiguity that needed to be re better refined. So they won't treat a council as something that's coming up with new doctrine or authorizing a new shift in the theology in the first place. Yeah, he says uh, the, the common belief is that, that outside this body of doctrine, there was only the play of more or less insignificant opinions, like a fitful guerrilla warfare on the flanks of a great army. Whereas what we really find on examining the evidence is that out of a mass of opinions, which for a long time fought as equals on an equal ground, there was a formed a vast alliance which was strong enough to shake off the extremes at once of conservatism and of speculation, but in which the speculation whose moments or monuments have perished had no less a share than the conservatism of which some monuments have survived. So he's saying basically this, this is a truism about how society operates, that society operates by a co coalition of shared interests who have common goals and come to compromises to drive out uh, their enemy, right? They, they come together. Um, they they might have small differences, but they're, they have a greater goal to expel some other form. And that these coalitions could, it's, it's not like pure doctrine. <laughs> the funny thing, um, these councils that are going on, everyone thinks that these are not ideological driven councils, that they're all sitting there yeah in the council chambers like debating theology like okay this theology <laughs> dispassionately trying to understand what the truth is right instead of like a game of thrones uh, yeah, or political plays like yeah i'll i'll do this for you you do this for me we could get this passed and that will further my interests that will further your interests and, i mean we've we see this in even like theological seminary stuff today wasn't uh so, so when when John Sanders was kicked out of the evangelical he was, theological seminary, you remember he was, he had, well, 
Dad called up one of the guys who was responsible for it, and they said, well, yeah, we know he didn't actually violate anything, but that's the only way we could kick him out, <laughs> is to say that he was denying inerrancy. It's yeah, so a political play. It, it, it's all political all the time. This is just, just how people function. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they don't typically care about the truth. Oh, there was uh, one time I was interacting with someone who's like, this person who was previously an Aryan then at this council, uh, like changed his mind. Like, like his implication was like, it was through like uh, <laughs> a very, a very detailed argument. And he's like, Oh, the evidence is very convincing. I'm going to change. That's, that's not how the world works. No, no one's doing that. It's, it's all behind the scenes, machinations that people see which way the wind is blowing. And that's the way they go. One of the examples on this program I like to use is when, when all the people in, in Africa, they heard that the bishop was teaching that God didn't have a body and uh, they rose up in protest and they were going to go kill him and they drag him outside uh, to kill him. And he's like, okay, I guess um, it's, it, I'm going to disclaim origin of Alexandria who believed that God didn't have a body. And I'm going to affirm that God had a body. And he's, and he made like some like lame excuse of why he said what he did because he didn't want to die. All right. <laughs> Right, he's politically motivated. These these are not ideological puritans. These are these are not people who are motivated by ideology ideology rather than politics. And, and Edward Hatch, a writing a hundred years ago, under twenty years ago, is acutely aware this this is how the real world works. People don't care about ideology; they care about politics. A coalition kicked out. The quote unquote Gnostics. We, we'd be calling Augustine a Gnostic today if he was driven out. If Augustine's faction lost, we would look at Augustine's special do think, enlightenment. Do you think the Gnosticism had staying power? It seemed like it was, it wouldn't have been able to become a major force of Christianity. It's, it's Calvinism. Calvinism claims that you need a special enlightening to understand the truths of the Bible and to really be saved. It seemed like it, it's more extreme than that, but maybe I misunderstand it, that, that it requires certain practices as well. But but it's very exclusionist thinking ensures right. that it doesn't spread. There, there's a special elect who are specially chosen by God to understand the spiritual things. It's literal, literally Calvinism. And so it, it's the modern variation. If those factions had lost, Augustine had lost, would be learning of Augustine like we learn about Origen. Origen fell out of favor. He was he's kind of a Gnostic. He was a Platonist, definitely. He believed in, in a cycle of life in which there's ebbs and flows from the divine one. And all of history was cyclical, that all everything emanates from God and returns and comes back again. And people are like, oh, no, we don't believe that. But uh, he, he was a good Platonist. But we'd be learning about Augustine like we learn about Origen. We'd be learning about Augustine like we learn about the Valentinians. Oh, Augustine believed what? About God being pure simplicity and having to reach God through his mind's eye, through introspective meditation. What? What is this? Like he, he Augustine in some of his sermons are, are teaching like African, African peasants about meditation to reach enlightenment. Like what is going on there? <laughs> he says the survey of the nature of the evidence enables us to determine the method which we should follow. We can trace the causes and we can see the effects, but we have only scanty information. He likes to use the word scanty, scanty information as to the in intermediate processes. If the evidence as to those processes existed in greater mass, if the writings of those who made the first uh, tentative efforts to give Christianity a Greek form had been preserved to us, it might have been possible to follow in order of time and country the influence of the several groups of ideas upon the several groups of Christians. He's just saying that there's, if we had more evidence, it would be better. We could still draw conclusions from the the evidence that we do have. The whole book's about this. This is, this is uh, like a uh, hundred thousand word book. It's a pretty detailed book. So I'm going to keep scrolling down. We'll skip some of this. And this is the introduction to the book? Yeah, this is the introduction to the book. Uh, and so he goes over all the details that were known at the time, which is quite a bit, actually. 
because well, a lot of this is just being transcribed over and over again in the monasteries, right? That's where you're getting most of this, the documents related to all of this. Um, yeah, it depends on the document. So he, he, he does this, this thing where he breaks up into paragraphs what he's going to talk about in his different chapters. So he's going to talk about the state of education, look at the Greek educational system. He's going to look at the, the state of literature in um, the first to fourth century. He's going to look at the philosophy uh, that was going around. He's going to look at the state of moral ideas. He's going to look at uh, the state of theological ideas. He's going to look at the state of religion as a whole. He says, we shall see then in the case of each great group of ideas, endeavor to ascertain from the earliest Christian documents, the original Christian ideas upon which they acted. And then compare the latter with the earlier form of those Christian ideas. It's like, it, it's, it's obvious that there is a change. You can read descriptions of God in the Bible and then compare them with descriptions of God by Gnostics, uh, by people like uh, Justin Martyr. I, I posted the other day about his, him going off about God not having parts and God being pure abstract mind and things. It, it, th those those descriptions, you're not going to find them in the Bible. Yep. But, uh, so I think it's pretty interesting how quickly all of these things became very important. It's, since we understand the thesis that we're saying, that basically because it's rooted in their culture, they're simply not going to fully convert into the Jewish mindset, for example. This sort of transition happens almost as soon as you evangelize people. It like it, It's not like, oh, they, they lost their way after 200 years and people were just debating. This is what the new Christians were bringing in as they were becoming Christian. Yeah, so Philo of Alexandria was a contemporary of Jesus, right? And so their 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 lifetimes overlap. And so while Jesus is preaching his gospel, his message in Israel, maybe it's like half a month's journey to a month's journey away in Egypt in a city called Alexandria, named after Alexander the Great, who uh, conquered the known world at the time, founded si uh, like 30 cities and named them all Alexander, and then Hellenized all those and introduced Hellenistic philosophy in one of those cities about half a month to a month journey away from where Jesus is preaching. There's a man teaching Platonic Judaism taking the works of Moses, reading it in a symbolic sense, and uh, teaching that the events of the Bible didn't happen, aren't real, are only symbolism for deeper philosophical truth. And so it's it's really interesting when you just look at the time frame of what's happening, where it's happening, mm -hmm. and what's being taught. And it's not as if, if we find one data point like that, that that is completely representative of the whole culture. So we already talked about the incident when the people rose up against uh, uh, the pastor, the, the preacher, preacher, the bishop, who said God didn't have a body. The common people are not of the opinions of the elites. These ideas have not flowed down to them and not been embedded in their conception of the divine. Augustine himself had not encountered the idea of an incorporeal God until he was in his 30s and encountered Platonism. Before that time, he had no understanding. He, His mom, of course, was a Christian. So when he grew up in a Christian household, this was not part of their teaching, the common person teaching in Christianity about the nature of God. It's Platonism that taught him this, and he's very explicit about this. Because they probably didn't talk about it at all. Well, he read the Bible and he said the Bible was absurd until he read it in light of Platonism because just the claims in the Bible. So if you read the Bible at face value, those are the things that he does not like. All right. So scrolling down. Uh, he, he cautions us. This is still the introduction. He ca cautions us to try to take our biases out of this study. Try, try to take, <laughs> he says, in the first place, it's necessary to take account of the demand which the study makes upon the attention of the imagination of the student. The scientific, that is the accurate study of history is comparatively new. The minute care which is required in the examination of the evidence for facts 
and the painful caution which is required in the forming of inferences are but inadequately appreciated. So uh, one example he uses, he, he probably uses it here somewhere. He's saying that people don't have like strong opinions. If you're studying like ancient Babylonian texts, you're not going to have a very strong opinion about what those people believed. And so you're just going to kind of take the evidence and treat it neutrally. But we don't we don't have that benefit when we come to Christianity. It's it, we we we're front loaded with a lot of assumptions that we we need to try to to be uh, ingenuous to be faithful. It, we, we need to try to get rid of those presuppositions. Yeah. I think I remember there, there was a part airman was complaining once that, you know, you either people, the only people who are interested in, in the biblical studies are people who really are doing it for biblical reasons. And so you can't avoid getting students who all will come in with the preconceptions you're not teaching a single person from scratch because either you're if you're dispassionate enough you don't care in the first place to even take on the the question but you can imagine that this is also infinitely more true in terms of the people who are writing on expensive parchment paper and vellum in the ancient era where, where only wealthy people could write massive tomes you're not going to be dispassionately writing something down yeah, I, I feel it very acutely when I'm reading very long ancient works. It's like, how did they have money for all this paper? They <laughs> they keep they say the same thing like over and over again too. It's like, oh no, Whereas it once it once is enough. They're they're writing the same way they speak because you know people are not thinking about you know writing concisely in those times. There's not, there's not like a a journalistic tradition or something like that where where you write in a totally different way yeah so here's the part i was referencing he says it's a comparatively easy task for a lecturer to present and for a hearer to realize an accurate picture of for example the religion of mexico or peru because the mind of the student when he begins the study is a comparatively blank slate sheet but most of us bring to the study of Christian history a number of conclusions already formed. We tend to beg the question before we examine it. So we 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 grow up in a in a culture of Christianity, and we can't help but bring in presuppositions that we ought to set aside when we're looking at the historical evidence. That's why my book I started out by saying that uh, talking about objectivity talking about getting rid of personal biases, uh, talking about how to treat the text so that we're treating it honestly rather than trying to be pundits. We don't want to be pundits when we're, when we're examining the text because um, if, if you care about what the text says, you, you don't want to be trying to advocate that a particular view out of those texts. I think that's all nice in theory. I don't know if it works that well in practice. Because you can't really say anything meaningful about something you're observing without making a claim that could be controversial. Right. Yes, of course. It's, it's hard to, but we, we need to, the best of our ability, remain the goal, neutral. Yeah, the goal is to be as neutral as possible. And, and so you'd have to find techniques to do that, I think. It's probably the only safest way. Because otherwise, it's difficult. It's, it's too difficult to be able to say anything meaningful about a text without essentially saying something that's could be considered an opinion about it. All right. Uh, so I'm going to scroll forward some more. Uh, he gives an example of things that we might just assume into the text, <laughs> like uh, the differentiation between spirit and body, right? So in the modern world, we're like, oh, spirit's one thing and the body's the other. And the spirit's like this ethereal substance that doesn't necessarily have a uh, place or, or space or matter, mm -hmm. but it's connected to the body in some sense. Uh, matter and spirit are different. Well, that's, that's a modern conception. It's not one that we should take for granted as being the biblical view. The biblical authors, <clears throat> when, when I read the Bible, it doesn't seem like that's their view. You have spirits interacting with the world all the time. You have God in Genesis, the spirit hovered above the face of the water. Uh, you, you have spirits being seen sometimes. It, it's not like 
it's not like the divine and the material are different realms of existence like like moderns might have yeah, let's not forget that spirit in the in the greek just means wind or breath depending on how you're using it but it's it's just what gives you vivaciousness all right and so oh here's one that he talks about he talks about baptism and then he says that it could be the case that the idea that we're cleansed by baptism is is because water purifies the soul like the water has purification properties over the soul things that these are just things that we need to consider right and so it's it's actually really interesting that to hear people talk like this about ancient israelite theology and so one thing i would uh recommend is uh that work that we've we've talked about before that i think you were on the program and we read a little bit of it lectures on the religion of of the semites things like that which which talk in ways that you don't hear modern christians talking about ancient uh hebrew semitic ideas right it'll, it'll, it'll give you this a weird perspective that you haven't heard before because the concepts are so remote to the modern way of thinking that it we there's just not not a place for dialogue in our culture about those concepts like uh blood blood as life force blood as bond people connected via blood relationships with their family things like that it's just it's not a modern conception All right, so uh, we're almost at an hour and a half. We'll we'll see what Elsie says. We'll scroll down a little bit more, but you kind of get that idea. So uh, this is a, a hundred thousand word document. Yeah, well, we I can pull it up and we can see how many words are in it roughly, because I've been mm -hmm. converting this to word format so that it's actually <laughs> readable. But you haven't gone through this whole thing yet, right? <laughs> I've been yeah. through I've been through in detail like 90% of this. Uh, it's oh it's it's been a lot of tedious work. 101,000 words, uh 101,844 words wow. give or take because I haven't cleaned up all the footnotes and things like that, but it's long and detailed. And uh, I've done a lot of work making this document readable. So uh, hopefully I, I could get a version of that out for people so that they don't have to read PDFs and could have a actual format that's, that's useful in the modern world. But this guy knows what he's talking about. I think he brings up a lot of good points. He's worth considering. And it's, it's a very good addition to understanding the ancient world. So what are your impressions? Edwin Hatch. I, I, it's amazing that he's seeing this at the time. And, and it must have been, uh, you said it's 200 years ago. It must have been aggravating to a lot of people. But what I'm really curious about is the, the works that he's actually looking at. Because it seems like there's a lot of new stuff that, that came about, in it's especially the 20th century. So he quotes a lot of uh, Pythagoreans, uh, Xenophon, you got, uh, let's see, Philo of Alexandria is pretty common, Marcus Aurelius, Pulfrey, of course, Plutarch. Uh, he, he quotes a lot of uh, Sextus Empress, Empress Sextus. Uh, it's, there are a lot of references, and a lot of references that I'm unfamiliar with that he goes through. We could grab random footnotes. Plutarch. Um, <laughs> uh, some of these these references don't have the author because he's quoting the author in the main text, but Philostrasis, Scopulanus, Mark of Byzantium. <laughs> oh, that's who they're talking about in those in, in Philostrasis. Oh, it's it's really detailed, and so and he's quoting all these obscure works as well that I'm not familiar with in all these different languages and he does he does the the scholar thing where you're just going along he doesn't do it so much in the body of his text but in his footnotes he's all he does it all the time he's like this is what this person did and he just quotes the straight greek and you're like okay i guess that that's something dio cassius 
Yeah, well, yeah, because at the time, anyone, like, you were required to get into college, you could, had to be able to read Latin and Greek. Yeah. And so all of his audience, this guy's writing to college-educated people, right? He should have just expect them all to know. He's lecturing. These are lectures that are transcribed. Mm. And so... Oh, so these are all lectures? Right, so like his lecture notes, uh, he had he had given lectures... Uh, based on his notes, he he wrote up most of his lectures into a readable format. Then he died, and there were trustees that took over his work and finished the last few lectures and pieced those together. And so he died before this is published, which is it was also incredibly sad to me that like this is like his own only work, and this man had this much intelligence yeah. and this much learning and this. It, 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 was he a professor? What was? What's yeah, he was like a professor or something like that. It it makes me sad. There's so many people in this world who spend their lives studying, accumulate all this information, and then they die and it just disappears. Yeah, and it's like this this guy has studied his entire life to build this document, and this is like the only thing that remains of his vast studies. Yeah. Which is a lot more than a lot of people, actually. Well, it is a lot more than a lot of people, but so much died with him is just, yeah, it's very sad, and be very sad if this this work disappeared from. <laughs> if people burn this like they burned the heretics, uh, Zacharias, who's that? This is Edwin Hatch. This is uh, the influence of Greek ideas on the Christian Church. You can find it on Google Books or there's an archive.org version. And you're probably best off with the PDF because the text files are almost unreadable. And so Edwin Hatch, sixth edition. But very good. Well, uh, about an hour and a half. I thank you for coming on and talking through this with me. So yeah. I, I think this is a good work. I, th I think this is a very valuable addition to anyone's studying of the ancient world. Just to get in the mindset and to understand and this guy's just, the whole thesis is it's very, very obvious that the Greek world influenced Christian theology. And here's just a whole ton of evidence that corroborates this fact. I know there it's, it's trendy in today's world for people to come and say, Oh, uh, the Hellenization of Christianity thesis is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's overestimated and, and r really uh, there wasn't any real Hellenization. It's like, what are you talking about? The evidence is overwhelming. The evidence is all in your face. It's just all you have to do is look. All you have to do is look and read and see for yourself. Don't take some random guy's word for it. This guy like quotes like a thousand. The footnotes are just incredibly detailed. And so you could go look at everything he claims to make see if, if what he's claiming is actually true. But uh, it, it's, it's an incredibly solid thesis that Christianity from the first century to the fourth century changed incredibly the form and function and the concerns, the value sets, and the metaphysics completely changed, completely wiped out and replaced with Hellenistic, primarily Platonistic principles and concerns. Well, yeah. So I, I think the, the key thing to understand is it happens immediately. The, the, the fact that you're spreading it to a certain group of people means it's just going to reflect what that certain group of people think. And so the church immediately changes depending on where it's at at any given time. It's a lot easier, too, in the ancient world when there's not a lot of communication between lots of different places for this change to take hold and entrench itself. Yeah, so if you like read Justin Martyr, he's like, I went through all these different schools of thoughts, and the last were the Platonists, who their fame was great, like they're the best school. And then I became a Christian. Oh, yeah, by the way. And then he's he has a dialogue with Typhro. He's like, by the way, and he makes all these Platonistic arguments. It's like, I think that last philosophy that you went through might, might have some holdovers, right? <laughs> Origin of Alexandria being a disciple of Ammonius Sactus, who also sure. taught Plotinus. There, there might, there might be. You might have just incorporated Christianity into your Platonism. That, that might be the case. What happened, right? 
but I'll let you go. But uh, thanks for coming on. And I, I thought it was a good time. And I think uh, very important. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, comments, put that down below or start a thread on the God is Open Facebook page. Thank you for listening.